Good afternoon. This is Campbell McCreary uh, from Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Braveheart Resources Inc. Braveheart trades on the venture as BHT, as in uh, Beta Helio uh, Telecom, and on o on the OTCQB as RIINF Rio Indigo Indigo Nevada Foxtrot. We do hope you'll enjoy today's program. It will also be available in replay mode. Uh, if you feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of uh, the GoToWebinar control panel or simply email them in and we'll ask the questions in real time. Um, Amvest is, uh, as many of you know, a New York-based investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resources space. Um, this, the uh, replay for this event will be available about an hour after the end at ambestcapital.com slash webinars. Um, everything has a disclaimer these days. This call is, is for informational purposes only. Uh, very pleased to have with us today, Evan Versens, the CEO, President, and Director. He's an engineer by background. He's a seasoned mining executive with over 35 years of experience in engineering operations, uh, maintenance, human resources, senior operations, and mine finance. He's led a number of management teams in Canada at operations, including Thompson Creek Metals, uh, Mount Milligan Mine, and Sangold's uh, Rice Lake Mine. Um, following the presentation, Anvest will be asking questions of management and uh, we'll um, uh, incorporate them into our line of questions. So, um, Ian, I'm going to try giving you the presentation again. I did not get one yet. Um, so, Ian, if you want to share your screen, and we'll uh, give it a shot. Can you move the slides? Still can't. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get it on to me, but why don't you uh, introduce us, get us going, and I'll yeah. share my screen. Thank you, Campbell, for the introduction and the chance to, uh, to speak with your audience today with Amvest. Um, as you introduced, uh, Braveheart is a, um, uh, be, or a Calgary based mining company with principal assets in Canada. Um, We're a, a combination of exploration, development, and soon to be producer. Uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're listed both in Canada and on the OTCQB. So I'll go to the next slide. Next. So in terms of the overall uh, company as we sit today, Braveheart has, um, it's really gone through a, uh, a reformatting or restructuring in terms of uh, our initial interests were at advanced uh, staged uh, exploration targets in, in southeastern British Columbia. So a lot of very grassroots. Uh, we've morphed into now acquiring three separate projects that are all at different stages. Um, our our uh, lead project, if you will, um, or flagship is our 100% owned Bull River mine near Cranbrook, British Columbia. That mine has significant past production. Uh, we were particularly intrigued by the infrastructure and uh, we have a large resource in place at this point in time. Um, our second project is a newer one to us. Uh, we acquired in December. It's called the Terry Project in Pickle Lake, Ontario. So where, while Bull River is copper, gold, and silver, the Terry Project is primarily copper, nickel, with palladium, platinum, silver, and gold. Uh, we recently completed a PEA on Terry and published that on CEDAR. Uh, very uh, positive PEA with a 242 million uh, uh, NPV at 6% discount rate. Uh, we acquired that project for about 2.5 million Canadian, and we have over $2.5 billion worth of metal value in the ground. The third project, which was really new to us two and a half years ago, is as of yesterday, we reacquired a past producing gold mine in Nelson, British Columbia which is about 300 kilometers away from our Bull River operation. Uh, that project has a 43101 resource that we actually built. And um, 
we're very intrigued by by that opportunity as kind of a supplemental feed for us. So all in all, our projects have uh, we've invested over 300. Previous previous owners have invested over 300 million in, in the various projects, and we're now in tier two tier one directions direct or jurisdictions being British Columbia and Ontario. Next next slide, thanks. Um, in terms of uh, structure, we have about 165 million shares out at this point in time. Um, management has a has a significant uh, ownership uh, in in the process, and uh, we do have uh, we do have some debt, uh, eight eight point six million dollars of debt, uh, and that's in two forms: one with the senior secured creditor, Matlock Farms. And the second portion of that is a convertible debenture, which we partially reduced earlier this year. Um, both both debt holders we consider friendly, and uh, our our plan right now is really to move one the first project Bull River forward, uh, followed by the other two projects. And uh, the the key issue for us right now we'd like to uh, increase our not only our retail base but also our institutional shareholder base. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the team, D David Johnson is our chairman and founder. Uh, David was involved initially with Braveheart as a private company and merged with a, com a public company called Rainbow back about nine years ago. So that was the history of it. Myself, I'm a mining engineer by training, primarily worked in Canada at a number of 30 complex underground gold mines. Uh, my background has been in gold, copper, oil sands, and, and primarily in coal. Eric Matt, Aaron Matlock is uh, one of our directors as well. Uh, he is the senior secured creditor and a large shareholder. And uh, Dwayne Vink is our is our CEO, a CFO. Next. And I'll go. Uh, I mean, very briefly, a lot of our directors are seasoned people having worked for some of the major companies here in Canada, uh, myself at Mount Milligan and Thompson Creek, David at Hut Bay. Um, I was at Sand Gold as well for about six years. Phil Keel um, is, uh, was with uh, Canadian Natural. So next slide. I won't get into the bios in, in, in great detail. Brian Murray has, uh, significant uh, public experience and uh, on various junior mining companies based in Toronto. Uh, Phil Keel is a mining engineer that worked most of his career in coal and oil sands and recently retired from Canadian Natural Resources. John Morgan is a geologist by training. Uh, John was most recently involved with the building of the Atlantic Gold project in, uh, in Nova Scotia. And uh, he's a geologist, as I said, by training with, with quite a bit of diverse mining experience. And Gester Christensen uh, is, uh, has an accounting background, but was previously uh, uh, president as well as uh, CFO at, uh, at Sand Gold. Next. So returning to Bull River for a minute, uh, the Bull River project is by comparison relatively small. We have about a 1.5 million ton resource that uh, would give us about six and a half years of production. Uh, in terms of life of mine, uh, that, that's based on an indicated resource. And uh, we also have about an, another 400,000 in an inferred uh, category. Uh, the project to restart is relatively cheap. Uh, we basically inherited when we bought the project through uh, the CCAA process, we did a plan of arrangement, which effectively allowed us to uh, deal with two senior secured creditors, uh, the unsecured creditors and the underlying shareholders. So at this point in time, there's about uh, $60 million of usable infrastructure in the underground, another 35 million on surface. So we have a fairly fully developed mill with four capital projects to complete, uh, and I can get into those in a minute. Uh, fairly strong uh, return. Uh, one of the unique situations with Bull River is we have 165,000 ton of surface stockpile. 
which is not low grade, but it's run of mine ore. So milling of that uh, current stockpile would give us initial feed for about eight months. And uh, the proceeds from that will allow us to be in a positive or free cash position at the end of just mining the, the surface stockpile. And uh, the other attribute with Bull River, when we acquired it, we actually purchased the shares of the underlying company, Purcell Basin Minerals. Primary reason was so we could secure about $152 million in tax pools. Next slide. So in terms of timeline, I alluded to four projects that we have underway. Uh, the first thing, we, we do have a, a permit right now that we could mine underground at 205 ton a day but uh, we're waiting on a new permit to dispose of tailings on surface so uh, the previous owners had reclaimed their tailings pond we're looking to implement what's called filter tailings as their tailings deposition initially tailings will be stored on surface and then subsequently they would be stored uh, underground or a combination um, the four key projects that we have at Bull River and all are, are in process. Uh, we have an op electrical upgrade where we're replacing uh, a transformer on surface. So we've already procured the transformer. Uh, we have a, a reconnection date with hydro and uh, we plan to reconnect to the grid power by uh, June of, of this summer which will give us all the hydroelectric power we need, not only to run the mill, but also to support the underground operation. Uh, we have a couple of upgrades that are in the mill. The mine's gonna be producing what's called a copper concentrate. And uh, so in order to do that, we need to replace the flotation circuit at the mill. Uh, we've procured tanks in terms of rougher and scavenger tanks already, and we're advanced stages of procuring a filtration circuit purpose generally of the filtration circuit will be to dewater the tailings down to about 10 to 12 percent moisture so that it can then be put on the ground as a as a dry stack or a filtered product. Uh, the fourth project then is is the actual construction of the tailings pond itself. We just completed detailed engineering. We invested, invested over four hundred thousand dollars in that aspect. So that project, the civil works for that will be required to be completed this summer. Next, thanks. So in terms of Bull River, what really intrigued us about this property, number one, it's 100% owned without any royalties. Uh, we consider BC and Canada as a favorable place to do business. Uh, we're in a unique situation that we have all weather roads to the mine site and we're connected to grid power. We are in conversations right now with the Tanaha First Nation that are based actually in Cranbrook. And the first step in that process is, is completion of an engagement protocol, which we've been working on in the last uh, week or two. It should be complete fairly soon. Permitting is really, we, 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 we've already begun the permitting process. We expect from the final application going in to receive permission in approximately six months time. So arguably Q3 of this year. Uh, previous owners invested over $200 million into the infrastructure, much of which, as I alluded to, is usable for us to go forward. Next. Um, again, I, I talked a little bit about the Bull River resource already, so I, I won't go into that detail. But uh, as a past producer, uh, the grade of this underground deposit is about 2.26% copper equivalent so with copper prices moving up significantly uh, in the last weeks and uh, some stabilization of gold and silver uh, the metal values both in the surface stockpile are now significant and uh, we have we talk about a six and a half year project the reality is we are pre-developed with drifts tunnels about 22 kilometers of tunnels down approximately uh, uh, 350 meters we did drilling earlier this year where um, we were able to, to uh, define the deposit 115 meters below the current bottom working. So we have a strong belief that the structures here could go to depth and there's nothing, there's nothing to say that they can't go down a thousand meters. Next. So 
So again, uh, this slide's a bit busy, but effectively, and I'll, I'll move to it because it's it's probably a, a little bit difficult to to look at here. But we had a previous scoping study done with a 40 million NPV on this project done in 2013. Uh, so that's really the base case, if we will, but metal prices have been improved since we this study was done. Next. So in terms of location, I alluded to this is we're close to established mining communities. We have the tech operations next in the next valley over in the Elk Valley, but we'll have uh, opportunity to draw employment or employees from Cranbrook, Fernie, and, and Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly was the home for the former Sullivan mine, which ran for almost 100 years. So when you look at infrastructure compared to a lot of projects, let's say in the northwest corner of BC, is um, we have uh, we have significant advantage over others in that we have not only roads and grid power but people nearby. Next. So the, this is just a, a picture of the facility. So th th this shows essentially um, the office buildings in the uh, foreground, uh, maintenance facilities in the in the, in the background. We have a crushing plant that can actually crush at 5,000 ton a day, and we have a mill that can run at 700 ton a day. So nominally, the run rate for this facility will be a, a 700 ton a day facility to get started, and then from there, we'll look at what uh, potential we have for expanding next. Uh, just an overview of the Bull River site plan itself. So there were two previous open pits one of which has been reclaimed and there is uh, filled with waste. The other open pit is still open and we're utilizing that as part of our uh, effluent discharge permit that's currently in place. Our dry stack will be placed uh, approximately equidistant between the current mill and the, um, and the stockpile. So in, in space, it's about a, the, the, the stockpile is about a kilometer away from the mill. Next. In terms of Terry, uh, Terry was a new acquisition for us in uh, in the fall, and what attracted us here is that it, there's a large resource uh, that uh, was a combination of about 22 million tons uh, in the underground, uh, which was previously mined between 1976 and, and uh, 1982, and uh, combined with that, um, there was a uh, significant drilling on a near surface deposit called K11. So we, we put a, a PEA out uh, recently, uh, earlier this year, and it had a very positive uh, NPV, as I mentioned, of 242 million. Uh, that was based on a $3.48 US copper price. The reality is if you use a price closer to 410, or $4, for example, the NPV of that project actually increases significantly and comes in at about 400 million. So it's very much based on the influence of copper. Uh, we like the fact that it is in Pickle, just outside of Pickle Lake, Ontario, which is a mining friendly town. And again, we have roads, uh, infrastructure and access, access to uh, human capital. Next. So the acquisition of Terry, um, we looked at this uh, effectively. We've bought this for 2.5 million Canadian. Uh, we are trying to make a determination on whether or not we would look at going underground first. Uh, the current underground workings are significant, but they are flooded. Uh, under the PEA, we have about 14 years under the current plan. And um, what we will be looking at is trying to combine uh, potentially the prospects of, the, of, of going back underground offset by the potential to uh, exploit a near surface deposit of about 53 million tons at K11 at about a grade of 0.4% of, uh, copper and 0.1% nickel. Uh, as I alluded to, there are, there, is, there are significant palladium attributes as well, which uh, we're trying to see if we can't get them into the payable category and the concentrate that we would, we would produce. Next slide. So again, um, when we look at uh, 
past production, uh, they determined they ran this mine at about a 1.7% copper uh, with Umex, and so we're really inheriting some significant structures. Uh, there is no mill at site at this point in time. All the surface infrastructure has been moved, but uh, there are tunnels uh, between shafts and declines and, and, and drifting activities in the underground, over 28 miles worth of underground workings. And uh, our current plan with Terry will be really to, uh, uh, we're currently negotiating an MOU or an engagement protocol leading to an MOU with, uh, with the Mishkegogamain Mich First Nation, who have been uh, the traditional landholders in the area, and they have had a reputation of being pro-mining and are working with a number of different constituents in that area. Um, we, uh, again, all the attributes for Braveheart of looking for projects that are near or at existing infrastructure, past production, and, um, and resources in the ground. Next. Um, so returning or coming back to Alpine as our third project here, uh, Alpine was our primary asset two and a half years ago. Uh, we dropped the option so that we could focus on Bull River, but we never forgot the fact that we had 140,000 ounces of gold in a resource category um, at 16 and a half grams. So now that we've acquired the Bull River mine, um, It'll be a fairly simple addition for us to add uh, flotate, or sorry, uh, gravity concentration. We've done work on ore sorting on the Alpine ore already. It performed extremely well. We were able to upgrade uh, a uh, composite sample from approximately 25 grams of gold to about 43 grams. So the, the gold ore is amenable to concentration, which means that rather than try to build a mill in proximity to the mine, which is at the top of the mountain, we would plan to uh, potentially mine, sort, and truck a high grade or concentrated product to Bull River, where it would go initially through a gravity separation, which would be uh, essentially integrated into that mill circuit. Uh, that particular project is uh, at Alpine, is, uh, it's virtually all gold and uh, some small silver. Next. So again, with Alpine, uh, the challenges with Alpine is that it's a relatively flat lying and narrow structure, but um, past production uh, graded about 0.68 ounces per ton or about 22 grams per ton was the historic mining. So though it was small, it was mined between 1938 and 1948. And so it would have been challenging times uh, logistically to get there and to do significant work. Uh, we completed a, P, or a, pre, a resource report with Gary Joe about two and a half years ago. And so we were able through our own drilling to actually identify a fairly significant deposit. There is significant regional history um, and uh, in terms of gold and silver production in that area and then further on to the Slocan Valley. Next slide. So again, difficult to see on this. There are a number of also prospects within this package, including the King Solomon, the Black Prince. Our primary purpose when we reacquired this uh, option agreement was first prize will be to complete a new road. We currently have a road to site, but it's not, it's really only accessible by ATVs. So we plan in the next 22 months to complete that road, if not sooner. And once that's done, and currently we're going to be looking to uh, uh, to actually get uh, up to the back into the mine. The mine is dewatered; it's, it's accessible uh, on multiple levels. Uh, but we would have to go and do some rehabilitation work and try to do more sampling to uh, to expand our knowledge of the current the current resource. Next. So I won't get into too detail here, but Alpine is a quartz vein structure. And uh, what I found was significant here is that we actually were able to, to do, through diamond drilling, uh, identify 19 grams over 1.7 meters and also about 38 grams over 1.4.
So that vein does pinch and swell, can be as thick as two meters. Uh, but when you can actually get coarse gold in a drill sample in a nuggety deposit, it, it is encouraging because a lot of time you'll drill for structure, but then you'll have to get in, in, into the mine and drift for grade. So the fact that in our initial program, we actually had two significant intercepts it, is certainly encouraging. Next slide. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the end of the formal presentation here. Uh, Campbell, I, I would uh, turn it over to you for, uh, for any, any questions or follow-up. Sure, sure. Thank you uh, very much. Um, please send in your questions. Just uh, use the question or chat function there. Um, now that you've acquired Thierry, how much capex do you predict will be required for the drilling exploration on that property? Well, I guess uh, capex and just drilling budget. Yeah. Yeah. So our plan for Terry for this summer will be uh, initially an exploration program of about a million, potentially a million and a half. We have interest from multiple parties. Uh, we want to make sure that we can get our exploration because we're the new owner. Uh, we need to apply to uh, for permission to drill, which we believe we'll get in fairly short order. And we also want to renew the relationship with the First Nations. So to start with, we would plan to be doing about a million a million dollars of drilling uh, as early as Q2 of this year. And depending on the success of that drilling, we might follow up with further. Uh, for the further drilling that would be the money would be raised through flow through uh, primarily where we're looking to attack is in the k1 there were two significant intercepts that were drilled by the previous owners that were over 800 feet at uh, at 0.4 percent uh, copper with nickel and palladium so those are those could be very significant for us to follow up on and uh and then we'll be looking to see whether or not it makes more sense to try to attack the underground or the open pit first. And uh, the capital cost to build Terry would be around 400 million Canadian, which is significant for a junior. It is potentially possible that we would maybe try to accelerate the open pit potential, which is only three kilometers away, and that could result in in lower capital costs to uh, to, to get to get moving. Okay. Um, how close is the newly optioned Alpine gold mine property to the other Braveheart assets? So we're about, uh, the Alpine mine is about 20 kilometers outside of Nelson, British Columbia, which is established community. And the distance from Nelson to um, Cranbrook is, is just under 300 uh, kilometers. So we're 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 approximately 300 to 325 kilometers or arguably 200 miles away sounds like a little bit of a distance but if we're trucking ore at 22 grams uh, then uh, the trucking costs are, are not prohibitive all right and then um what kind of mineralization does the alpine project have yeah it's kind of um it's a flat line, it's almost like a coal seam, but it's a flat line quartz structure. Um, the mineralized material tends to be closer to the hanging wall than the foot wall. And uh, in the the guys that ran this before, they were kind of mining it as a room and pillar. And so they were looking to, they left pillars in areas that might be lower grade um, or, or thinner mining widths. Uh, but but basically it's mining a quartz structure and as I mentioned before it's a very nuggety deposit um, but uh, and the gray and the gold is, is 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 gravity recoverable or free milling if you will. What kind of impact are you expecting from the ore sorting studies for the Bull River mine? That's a great question. Um, we're really optimistic because having now acquired reacquired the Alpine property through option. Um, the study that we did almost two years ago was very favorable. So we've already demonstrated that ore sorting could work for Alpine. Um, we we uh, recently began an ore sorting study at Bull River. 
We sent our samples to Tomra uh, in Hamburg, Germany. They've just returned to Canada for, for uh, assaying, but effectively the uh, X-ray transmission technology, sensor technology was, uh, was very worked. And uh, so that would be the type of technology we'd be looking at. And uh, so for argument's sake, at the 165 ton surface stockpile, we would look at pre-sorting that material and we may be able to eliminate, call it 40 to 60,000 ton of material that would arguably be non-acid generating waste that doesn't need to go through the mill. So for argument's sake, for every ton that we don't go through the mill, we would save $20, $20 a ton on processing. So that's our expectation is that at this point, uh, we really need to see the, um, the assay values because if, if, you, if you sort, but then you lose your material into the waste, then you, you may not have achieved much, but it would appear that your sorting will be work for Alpine or work for Bull River. And, uh, and then the next step for us would be to understand whether or not it's, it's, uh, could be uh, attributable as well to Terry because Terry's about the same 1.7% primarity of calcopyrite. And uh, if, um, if we can demonstrate through doing ore sorting on some of the new drill core that we could uh, pre-concentrate, that would give us an advantage where when it comes time to design the, the new mill, uh, you could either design a mill that can take a higher grade product, or you could design a mill that does pre-concentration, so arguably it could be a, a smaller mill to get the same results. So it really has an impact to help us on all three of our current projects. Okay, Stu? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Ian. I guess I'll just continue on the ore sorting. Uh, and so are you going to apply this at theory as well? Yes, I mean, that, that was my point is that uh, we're going to get some new new samples uh, from the drilling program this summer. Some of that material could be sent for initial testing. And if we can demonstrate that it is it can be used at Terry, then it has a potentially a huge ramification on the design of the mill. So if the mill was going to be designed originally, let's say at 4,000 ton a day, you could either maybe design your mill for 2,000 or 3,000 at lower capital cost, but you would be sending a higher grade product. The other thing that happens as the projects get bigger is the primary cost of running any mill typically is, is power. So, uh, and that is usually consumed in the grinding circuit after crushing. So anything you can do to not send low grade material to your crushing grinding circuit um, is, is, is a positive. So as I say, we'll, we'll test it first at the Bull River and then we'll have ample time to, to decide whether or not it can be integrated into the, the, the mill design. Because a, a lot of operations, particularly in Australia, they've integrated or sorting, but they're typically doing it at an established operation so it's more of an integration at that point in time than it is uh, designing it uh, as, as part of, of the combination circuit. Gotcha, thanks. And then um, I guess like on a high level, you know, the plan is the plan from your point of view, get uh, Bull River into production, you know, use that uh, cash flow to fund the uh, development and exploration at, at theory and then down the track Alpine would that be yeah so no it's a good events? question again so in terms strategically uh, from 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 a cash flow point of view um, Bull River will should generate positive cash for the next six and a half seven years depending on what we find at depth uh, Bull River will not on its own be enough to finance building a project at Terry. Um, but what we would plan to do is that as we're bringing Bull River online, we'll be trying to accelerate initially a bulk sample from Alpine, followed by arguably a, a production decision. 
Uh, Alpine already has infrastructure in place that's usable. So the capital costs to get going at Alpine are low. Alpine is up at elevation. So there are some challenges about seasonality, but uh, it's a relatively inexpensive approach to get going if we have a permit from government. It's our belief if we simply are looking, um, it's less than a five hectare disturbance at the top of the hill. So because we're looking to do underground mining, uh, we don't have a large footprint. And so as a result, reclamation costs permitting should be, um, I'm not saying relatively simple, but it, it's a different level of, of, uh, of, of discussion in terms of trying to bring that project forward. Because we plan to truck a product off the hill as compared to mill, uh, it should again um, uh, be positively received in our mind. And uh, we're currently working with the forestry group to, uh, to begin uh, the, the access route to the top of the mine. Uh, going forward initially in the first year or two, we'll probably be using expiration dollars at Terry, uh, some of which can be raised through flow through in Canada, uh, but that's how we would probably spend our expiration dollars uh, at, at Terry drilling and uh, at Bull River, a combination of, of a new road to the site plus some, uh, some drilling to augment what we already know about the deposit. Okay, thanks. And then some, I mean, Bull River is a small scale com compared to uh, theory, but would some, you know, some people get worried about restarting smaller scale operations in a junior model based off an indicated resource or a PA, you know, what, how does your approach to restarting operations at, you know, Bull River to, to start make you feel comfortable that it will be successful? Yeah, so, uh, I'm of the view that the some of these pre-fees and fees become a cottage industry. They, um, you know, you can you can uh, do these studies till the death of the project and you miss a cycle. So when I look at Bull River, when previous operators have, you know, in their judgment, they they took 165,000 tons of mineralized material from the center of the deposit to surface and and we know the grade of that material, it behooves us to, to get going. Um, I would rather spend a quarter of a million dollars to actually install the new flotation circuit than to do a pre-feasibility study on an answer that my board already understands. So there is a place for them, certainly I think, but uh, in our projects, because of the past production and the ability to walk in the tunnels and and uh and get access for sampling uh we're comfortable there's been enough technical work in terms of bull river it was a past producer under placid oil subsequently we had a technical study done by, by snowden uh engineering uh initially followed by roscoe possel followed by moose mountain so there's been three different studies done they give us a really good feel for the integrity of the resource. And um, again, to me, uh, when Bull River has been pre-developed, we have seven different sub-levels that were drifted on or sealed on the ore. So those are effectively seven large diamond drill holes through the center of the deposit. Um, so that 165,000 tons that's on surface is, although, in the resource we're only given credit as indicated there's no question a portion of that is actually measured so we think it's uh, we're better off to spend money reconnecting to the grid power than we are let's say to do studies to support a, a uh, you know a decision to bring in four million dollars okay that makes sense and the the recent um you know, acquisition of theory. Uh, how long are Cadillac's 11 million shares locked up for as part of the consideration? Uh, I, could you rephrase that? I couldn't quite understand the question. The, the 11 million shares in Braveheart that were issued to Cadillac as part of the transaction. Yes. Just wondering what the lockup period on oh, those sorry, shares yeah. are. Uh, so typically under the TSX, it's, it's a four month lockup period. 
uh, four months and a day. So those are not free trading at this point in time. And um, as you may note, we uh, when we purchased uh, Terry, uh, again, um, we uh, we inherited by by purchasing the shares of the subsidiary company Cadillac Venture Holdings, we secured a hundred million uh, dollars of tax pools. So uh, so the shares right now, uh, we had a provision where the initial deal there was a two percent NSR on the project. Uh, we repurchased that NSR for 2.5 million additional shares. So uh, effectively, that's how we now have it 100% owned, no royalties. And uh, Cadillac will have free trading shares in uh, probably sometime in uh, in April. And then the tax loss, tax losses, do, does that apply just for operations in that province or is it? across you know the whole of Canada yeah it's a bit complex but it, but we're we're fairly comfortable that they can be used specifically at that project um, whether they could be applied to another producer um, that becomes a question for the tax experts uh, our experience is that if we use them at the property like for example our 152 million that we have at Bull River um, when we bring if and when we bring uh, gold mineralized material from Alpine, um, we would be able to uh, deplete those tax pools. So uh, at the Alpine, uh, sorry, at the, at the Blue River Mill. So we believe that the tax pools are specific to the mining properties where the milling is going to be done. Yep, that's great. And one last question from me um, before I pass to Artie. What would be the steps required to receive that the updated rehabilitation plan from the uh, the ministry in Ontario? Oh, okay. So in Ontario, uh, the, the, the mine was closed out uh, in 1997. And what that meant is that the previous owners at Truscan had satisfied the government with respect to removal of buildings, uh, capping of, of raises and shafts, securing the property, uh, so that was done to satisfaction of the government in 1997. Subsequently, there's been new legislation and new language. So with that project, on a priority basis, we're going to have to look at, at some of the elements to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get going with the, from the perspective that you look at what does the final closure plan look like. So that'll be the new way of looking at that that situation um, so so going forward in terms of the permits there'll be there'll really be a couple of phases that the permission to get a drill doing expiration drilling is a a relatively non-complex proper or a program and and that's what previous operators like Cadillac and Richview had done they drilled fairly much each year between 2010 and 2013. Uh, so that is an exploration permit. To actually go back and do mining would it would require what's termed an advanced exploration permit, which typically you need to get some baseline data, and, and that normally is about three years. So because the property has been maintained um, and there's been water sampling going on, there'll be a question of, of whether or not the current baseline information is sufficient, for example, for us to go and, and start dewatering the underground mine. So it's very still early days for us. We've only had the project less than 90 days. So we are in discussion with regulators as far as their expectations. Thanks for that, Artie. Um, thank you. What will what will be the characteristics of your tailings at uh, Bull, Bull River Mine, and uh, what what uh, what uh, items are critical in terms of getting the uh, milling permit? So, I'll try to ask the well. I'll try to two questions there. I guess. I mean, the first thing is that the um, the host rock at at Bull River is really carbonaceous, so it, it has a neutralizing effect. The current um, 
mineralized material, which I'll call PAG or, or par partially acid generating, which has the sulfide ores, that's sitting on top of a NAG or non-acid generating waste pile. So our belief is that when the dry stack is done, we'll be, we would basically be taking out the metal values, the copper, gold, silver, and some cobalt. And uh, so we would be eliminating, call it the acid generating potential of the tailings. And under the current, uh, the way the, the dry stack is being built, uh, any kind of runoff from the dry stack actually reports into the current open pit. So there would be uh, dilution there, if you will, because we still have to continue to pump water from the underground. So it, uh, you know, we'll have to we'll have to measure to see whether or not there is any um, acid generating capability coming from the dry stack, but it will be reduced by all the metals that are extracted. Uh, I think the other question was with respect to the permit process. So uh, the permit was a process was originally, I'll call it aborted in 2016 when the previous owners ran out of money and the process stalled. But at that time, the principal concerns by government with respect to initially granting us a uh, amendment to our permit so we can mill tail or process, process uh, material and place tailings will be water management. And uh, it's our belief, we currently discharge to the environment on a daily basis uh, through a series of polishing ponds and uh, all of our current water discharge is within regulation. Uh, when we begin the milling operation, uh, we're going to actually be using the open pit, which is part of the polishing program. So uh, my belief is that at least when we run the surface stockpile through the mill, we'll actually be a net consumer of water. So we're going to have to augment um, the water that's in the pit with more water from underground drill holes and surface wells. So we we really, at that point, there'll be limited, if if any, discharge to the environment, but we are going to have to do water sampling in terms of groundwater and surface water sampling. So the main issue will be water and water management. And then the second issue was uh, dry stack or filter tailings is a relatively new concept in, in Western Canada. Um, I was involved as early as uh, 2007 at the Minto mine where we implemented dry stack. So one of the questions that has been asked is, is the stability or the design of the dry stack. We engage Stantec Engineering who have worked around the world, including Turkey, uh, in, uh, in dry stack and management designs. So we have completed the, the detailed dry stack design. That was a shortcoming, uh, observed as a shortcoming by the previous application uh, by the regulators. So we think that we have solved that issue and we have a, we have a design that will be acceptable to, to government. So those are the real two issues. Thank you so much. Um, And when you when you uh, when you will be done with the uh, milling of the surface stockpile, uh, will you need to modify the mill again when you are going to do a transition to the or from the underground? Uh, th there shouldn't really be any change. The circle will be the same. The changes that would be integrated over time is that if we begin to move to kind of more of a hybrid tailings deposition where some of the tailings goes into uh, the dry stack and some goes underground, we would have to add a paste backfill plant. So because we'll already be filtering the product uh, through the filtration system, uh, we would then be adding, uh, adding a, a facility so we could put cemented backfill underground. That'd be the main change. The other change is very modest and that would be, um, the integration of a, a small gravity circuit, either a Nelson or, or Falcon concentrator, which would be put in proximity to the um, to the to the grinding mill or the ball mill, 
Uh, those are the real changes. The other decision will be is do we invest on a permanent basis in an ore sorter? Uh, they run approximately a million dollars and um, the current thinking would be that um, we, uh, we may want to uh, take underground material to a surface stockpile and do the sorting there in the first phase when we're simply planning to sort the material that's on deck we're going to use the existing crusher uh, in concert with the ore sorter. So those are really the only issues that the um, uh, the, the transformer that we're buying is actually 10 megawatt and under the current mine plan to run at 700 ton a day uh, we'll need approximately 5 megawatt max so we'll have uh, we'll certainly have some expansion capability with the existing infrastructure. Thank you. Campbell? Sure. Um, someone just sent in just for some clarification. How much capex, if any, is needed to produce fresh underground ore at Bull River, other than stockpile above ground? Um, also, any additional permitting required? Would the off-taker, who would, who would be the off-taker, and what are the logistics getting it to smelter? So we're currently in discussion with three, well, we have been in discussion with three parties on an offtake agreement. Uh, we've given one party a period of exclusivity uh, to, uh, to complete a transaction. Uh, we're looking at a combination where, where a party would get an offtake agreement. Uh, we've shared the specs on our, on our concentrate, and we know that we have a saleable product um and um uh, but what we're looking for is a bit of a prepay on the value of the surface pile by whoever that provider is so so that that's one part of it the the earlier part of the question was with respect to underground we've got 22 kilometers of tunnels so the decline goes to the bottom of uh of the mine which accesses number nine level we could arguably go stoping tomorrow in the underground uh, on, on any one of the seven levels without spending money on capital. The capital really will be associated with taking the decline deeper um, and it would be associated with potentially replacement of the, uh, the mobile fleet, which is fairly dated. So uh, be, to begin with, we're going to use our older fleet and then look at at what will be the costs and mechanical availabilities of those equipment. But the, the underground capital costs surprisingly are very modest and uh, we're able to leverage about $60 million of, of, uh, of infrastructure that was built by the previous owner. Uh, moving back to theory for a, for a second, uh, it's had a long history. Now what, what are the current in his words, positive signs other than the high copper price. Uh, what else shine for you? So well, I mean, 22. I mean, 22 million tons at at about a 1.7. Um, that's not super high grade, but it's certainly, you know, depending on the other metal values, um, is significant to get going. Uh, when uh, when Umex ran it between 76 and up to 81, um, they only were really recovering the copper. So the nickel is there. They, they, they only in the last year of operation began to recover nickel, silver, gold, and platinum palladium. And of course, back then, palladium prices were probably about $50 an ounce. Today, they're 2,200, but the challenge is really gonna be, will the palladium be high enough grade i.e. over two and a half grams so that it actually reports to the concentrate because if we don't make that threshold the the smelter will get our platinum and palladium but we won't get any money for it so uh i think really it's the size of the deposit past production and uh and again looking to introduce new technology uh and processing techniques that might not have been available to them you know, approximately uh, 35 years ago. Excellent. Um, what is your yearly overhead costs? What is your overall budget for 2021? And how much cash is currently on the balance sheet? 
Could you discuss prior capital raises and who participated in them? Wow. So a couple of questions there. So our, our, current cash, our current cash balance is just over uh, about $550,000. Um, our cash burn uh, kind of administratively will and uh, care and maintenance of the mine is about 75,000 a month. So we have sufficient funds in treasury to get us into the summer. Uh, we will need a combination of hard dollars and, and arguably uh, some flow through dollars to keep going. Uh, depending on whether we're able to successfully negotiate a prepay on, on some of the stockpile, that will certainly influence our need to go to the market, either for let's say a debt financing, another another debenture, um, uh, or, or or some sort of sort some sort of a private placement. So I'm expecting that we should know within a month about about the current uh, financing we're trying to close, and if if we're successful, then uh, then that'll of course that'll improve our our cash position. Uh, we we aren't going to put money into Terry this summer uh, unless we're able to raise flow through, and the whole the whole challenge there will be flow through. You need to be sp able to spend it within the time frame. So if we look, if we raise it too late, then will we have time to spend it? So there's a number of balls in the air on that front, and we were we're likely uh, we don't have any warrants that are imminent, so we'll. Uh, we'll have to be looking in the next coming months as to how do we finish the capital spend at Bull River and then enjoy the the proceeds from uh, from the processing of that ore. Okay, um, got time for one more question, an interesting one. Uh, with an aggressive 2021 timeline of capital projects, have you been able to secure critical chemical reagents, which may be in short supply, i.e. sodium cyanide? So I've heard this asked in other webinars. So uh, yeah. So, so so number one, we we aren't using cyanide in our process. So we'll be using xanthates and some fairly standard uh, reagents to produce the copper concentrate. Um, people may be thinking about cyanide because we're talking about gold, but in our circuit, in processing the gold ore from Alpine, should it come. Uh, that would be primarily gravity recoverable 80%, and the other 15% would report to a, a copper concentrate that again would have been would have been uh, collected under standard flotation uh, uh, reagents. Okay, excellent. Um, Want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be queuing you for feedback. Please share a few words. It'll get to Ian and his team uh, very quickly the replay will be available in about an hour or so uh you'll get it in an email and um you can also go to ambestcapital.com slash webinars and it'll be there as well this evening um and uh ian i'll pass it back to you um you know with, with a closing statement and i always ask um uh why buy your stock now <laughs> so well I, I think, morning. <laughs> yeah Thanks very much, uh, Campbell. Um, I almost don't want to put out a press release anymore because every time we put out a very interesting, informative press release, we seem to get hurt. Um, I think we've got a we've got a stable here of very uh, number one past producing projects advanced. They all have technical reports. They all have infrastructure that we can leverage. So. I don't know, and we're in a favorable jurisdiction in Canada, two favorable jurisdictions. So I think that for us to be valued under 20 million Canadian with the quality of our assets, it, it boggles my mind. I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity, uh, especially now with uh, acquiring three different types of projects, but clearly um, Bull River will give us the catalyst to uh, number one, become debt free in the very foreseeable future. And uh, that will then allow us to sequentially, you know, bring Alpine along concurrently while we make some decisions on Terry. So I just think we've got the right metals. Uh, we're in a situation where with the new move to batteries and the green economy, um, 
last time I checked, you need 8% copper in a battery. So as much as graphite and other are, are important, copper is as well as having other values. So I think our proposition by having copper, uh, copper, gold, and as I said in a previous uh, press release, we have over 4 million ounces of silver in situ in our, in our, in our three properties. So I like our suite of metals. I like our suite of properties, and and I and I think we're uh, we're posed for some uh, some significant uh, uh, share appreciation. Thank you, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in tonight. And um, we'll catch you on the next webinar. Good day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Campbell. Thank you, Ian.